Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross joined forces again to compose a propulsive and immersive music for Damon Lindelof's masterpiece, Watchmen. I'm Rob LaCuria, senior editor here at Tom Derby. Guys, we could literally spend the next five hours talking about your career and your contribution to music over the decades, but I won't do that to you because I know you have other things to do today. So first up, let's focus on Watchmen. And how did you end up composing for this show? Well, we several years ago sat with our film agent and kind of said, hey, here's some directors and projects that we'd be interested in to kind of proactively reach out rather than sit around waiting for the phone to ring. And we've gotten wind that HBO was moving forward with Watchmen, and w which we love. The graphic novel was very uh, important to us. But m more than that, we've been very eager to work with Damon Lindelof. Um, what we've learned in our journeys and collaborations with, with other filmmakers um in our in our day job of nine inch nails you know it's pretty much us insular in a room doing what we do and we we have a good rapport and we you know it, it feels ripe and full of excitement and, and lots more to go um as we kind of stumbled into directing films and tv shows uh it's a it's a form of forced collaboration that was kind of foreign particularly to me and what we learn through that is um, it can be an incredibly rewarding experience, you know, kind of behind the curve of humanity on what value there is to collaboration. But, you know, working with the David Fincher um, on a project that you're not in control of, but you're contributing to is a really exciting thing. And what we've learned over the various projects we've taken, uh, been a part of, is the the real appeal to us is working with that person that can push us and teach us and um, challenge us into something that feels great when it's a real camaraderie. And just um, as a fan of Damon's work, I thought and Atticus agree that it was um, he's somebody that he, he seemed like he'd be one of us if we got a chance to meet him. And, and as it turns out, when things lined up, we very much feel that way and working on Watchmen was a super rewarding, extremely difficult and fulfilling project to be involved in. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the score is really dense with lots of um, beautiful themes and hooks that, um, you know, recur throughout the score like most scores do for the track. Uh, how the West was really one um, includes these cues that recur throughout the score and, to me, it's like an addictive mix of sci-fi, ominous sci-fi, like retro electronic. Can you talk us through your inspiration for what what I think is the most identifiable track on the score? Well, with that piece, it was right at the beginning of our uh, collaboration. And, and, you know, Atticus and I were talking about this the other day. When we first met with Damon, it was to kind of get an understanding of what what his approach was going to be with Watchmen property. And we had a eventful hour or so meeting with him and the producers and writers. And we left kind of knowing less than we did when we went in there because we were bombarded with an impenetrably dense, unfinished kind of season one arc. And But we did know that it was going to be cerebral and it was well thought through and it was made with passion and it was made with integrity. We didn't really know what role music was going to play. Was it a was it a supporting role? Was it something that kind of uh, sublimely influences the viewer, or is it more of a featured character almost? So the first few we wrote what Atticus about an hour of music, an hour and a half, something like that. Yeah, we wrote. Uh, I think it was about an hour and a half, fifteen pieces based off the scripts. Yeah, and the scripts at that time were episode one and maybe maybe two. Um, we hadn't seen anything. And it was really just to kind of see where Damon's head was at because he didn't leave a lot of clues as to what um, he was looking for, which is good because he, he didn't define, I want exactly this. That Those situations we find can be a little tedious at times. So we were just feeling around, and How the West is Really One was kind of a, 
just kind of came to us as a nice moody piece, certainly carpenter influenced, um, a little retro, uh, but felt like it had the right level of kind of menace and something sexy about it. You know, it was, we, we liked it. When we turned these in to Damon and experimented around, and, they, and we wrote a lot of music, as we said, that wasn't to picture. It was just, does this seem like it's in the ballpark does it does it inspire you does it feel right um not long after that we saw a real rough cut of episode one and just where they he and his editor placed a few things of what we did really informed us as to what the what the series was going to be like for example uh, music was going to be much more in the forefront and driving certain scenes uh, rather than it being, say, effects-driven um, or sound effects-driven. It was going to almost play like a music video at times. You know, and that was exciting, exciting for us because we had a, a larger kind of palette to, to paint on, a larger canvas to paint on. Um, I, I could ramble on, but that... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add a little something to that, because that yeah. particular track was the only i think the only one um that made it into uh the show from that original batch of writing based off the scripts and it was one that damon immediately responded to he was like this is this sounds like watchmen and then like trent said when we got the pilot or whatever you want, you want to call it episode one and we saw, you know, like Trent has described, what the role of music is. That was when we could really take off and start, uh, you know, putting the foot on the gas kind of thing. And and it was interesting as well because we got we got that pilot. We were actually touring at the time, so we got the pilot in. Um, I think we had like 10 days off or something and we did traffic stop, you know, that like traffic stop, yeah. something else. And then Sister Night's theme was written in a hotel in Chicago um, as, we, as we took off on the next leg of the tour. So it's kind of like, you know, there was a, there was an interesting kind of journey physically and emotionally in the in the early bit yeah um there's a lot of tracks that are you know beautifully meditative and ambient there's some that are very percussive uh um, but obviously a lot of your scores use these really interesting synth sounds and bass um, like the track like um none with the motherfucking guns a really really good example of how that perfectly fits that bill um, and it's one of the first tracks in Volume 1, which really kind of gets us into the mood of it. What, what is it about EDM and working in that space that you find it um, effective for film scoring? Go ahead, Ed. Well, I was going to say, I, don't, I, I would be very loath to use the term EDM in, uh, in our work. Um, I don't particularly know why, but... Um, well, I, I know why, because EDM kind of, kind of says Sahara dance tent, uh, laptop <laughs> music. <laughs> and not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's not what yeah. interests us that much. You know, I think what you're getting yeah. at, we, re we included a few things early on with Damon that were more beat driven, that could have been, could have gone another direction into a Nine Inch Nails demo, perhaps. That yeah. normally we we wouldn't have the opportunity to venture into that space in a in a score situation, and that was a lot of stuff that Damon really really clicked with him. And we thought, okay, this could be fun in a way that's not the other side of the planet from Nine Inch Nails type based music. It allowed us to open up the toolkit or open up our toolbox into the stuff that we can do in the band, the techniques and the arrangements and the recording styles and the instrumentation and things like that. So it, this was a refreshing project, mainly because the people we were working with were excellent. 
and and I mean Damon primarily, just a smart guy that will not settle for anything less than excellence, and that's, that's what drives us as well. And additionally, it allowed it to kind of play in a sandbox we don't get to play with that much in the world of scoring. So we, we got to get into distortion and guitars and, and rhythms and drums and um, electric distorted bass and things like that. And I think it was the right call for the series because it, it gave it a, I don't want to say playfulness, but say that first episode radically different than when you see her running across the field and that music's playing, it's driving or driving in a car fast and you hear that raunchy bass, it's kind of sleazy sounding. It really gives it a, an attitude that um, we were glad that he was up for trying that sort of approach to it. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, guess. I was just going to echo what Trent said, and that that was the track I was talking about that was written in the hotel room with none with the mother, motherfucking gun, um, and we had the picture then, so we knew what we were dealing with. And in in some ways, I'd I'd say it was kind of like being let off the leash with Damon. That's not to say that there wasn't heavy discussion, sometimes disagreement, never with any malice or anything, but there was talk of, you know, what should be what, you know, later on when Manhattan uh, um, finally captured, we, we very much didn't want to play the action and there was some idea that maybe it should have this or that and whatever. Um, you know, it was a process, but I feel like Trent said, this is certainly one of the best collaborations we've ever had. And it was also one of the funnest recording kind of score experiences for the reasons that you just mentioned. Even though it wasn't yeah. even though it wasn't EDM. Okay, and I, so apologies for even using that term, but I, I totally get where you're coming from. And but for me, I thought Watchmen was <clears throat> quite a masterpiece. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I said, I just thought the show was one of the best things I've ever seen, and and that's because um, I spent many episodes working out what what were the motivations of these characters, who's good, who's bad. Um, and I wonder when you're scoring something like that. Normally, a score underpins the emotional kind of motivation of the characters and tries to help the audience feel something. Your score doesn't do that. It's just like a lot of your other scores, actually. How challenging is it, though, to to play that very um, essential role in the in the film or the TV show without quite understanding what the characters are trying to achieve? I mean, a lot of it really was instinct, you know, and I don't mean to sound arrogant saying that, but we read the script. We would usually, before we'd start on an episode, have a discussion with Damon about, it was always Damon, about general arcs and motivation, not not too specific, but general things. And then we'd turn a bunch of stuff in and then get feedback and say, you know, I'd say 80% of the time it would be right on, you know, with, with these tweaks. Sometimes it would be... Uh, you've misread my intent is actually this it's the opposite of that i can't because my terrible short-term memory i can't give you a great example of one of those but there'd be a handful of times where we're playing at a certain way where he come back and say no it needs to we need to make sure this is the moment when you know x or y happens build up to that um that was helpful and I can't think of any through the whole series where we disagreed and after we'd done it his way, his wasn't better, you know. Um, and not too much of it. There isn't a ton of kind of agonizing about motivation, but really just kind of immerse yourself in the script. And before we start writing for picture, we've spent some time deeply thinking about what's being said. You know, and I think I think I'll mention kind of a strategy that Alex and I, Alex and I discovered you know, when we were doing Social Network. You know, we've been I'd often wondered, not ever having composed for picture. Hey, here's a 15 second piece of music where someone turns a corner and walks up the stairs. How does how do you write that? 
Is there a melody? Is there a chorus in there? Does it, does it matter if there's a chord change? Should there be a chord? I mean, I had to write a song, that, but I don't know how to write for that scene, right? And what we realized was if we just emotionally kind of get in the space, then it comes out if we're not overthinking it, you know, if we're in, the, in a similar mindset. That's what we do when we write a song. We've got a story to tell usually. What is that story? How does that story feel? How do I want to make people feel when they hear this song? Do I want to play with the lyric? Do I want to play against the lyric? Do I want it to feel un uncomfortable? Do I want it to feel like it's sliding into something that's release, etc.? And when we just think about scoring for picture that way and then just start to make music, it's pretty clear to us, you know, then it goes through a kind of taste filter of saying, this is pretty cool, or hey, this sucks, or this doesn't work. You know, watch it again to yeah. picture, but it's it's not a lot of. I mean, we will spend a lot of time overthinking things, but that's not one of them. That one we kind of go with trusting our kind of emotional impulse, you know, and 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 then if it's wrong, the director will has no problem bringing that up, and we we pivot. I think that some people, and I do have friend. Well, I don't really have many friends, but I have acquaintances <laughs> who are film composers who who look at it in a different light to what we do which is more artisan in the sense of i'm getting a film in it has some temp i have to make a cue that's this long for this bit and sounds like this and this long for this bit that sounds like that and that's almost the opposite of how we approach things um Going back to the idea of world building, and particularly within Watchmen, we are trying to create a world, but it's approaching it more from the standpoint of being an artist than an artisan. And I don't, I'm not saying that with any judgment or any bullshit. I'm just saying that's yeah. how we come at it. Yeah. So I'm going to pivot to a, a few other things before we wrap up. Um, you know, you've won plenty of awards in your careers, but the Oscar win in 2011 would have, I, I assume, been like one of the highlights. And you guys look genuinely stunned and almost speechless when um, Hugh Jackman and Nicole Kidman announced your names and you walked up to the stage and you thanked your loved ones. And I think, um, Trent, you said it was humbling and flattering beyond words. And Atticus, you called Trent a human. For all of us fans, you know, Handcovers Bruise and Emotion for me are one of some of the greatest tracks of all time. I listen to them all the time. I love that soundtrack. We were so happy to see you guys win in that establishment. So talk us through that night and winning that award. Atticus, would you like to take the honours? Uh, I'll, I'll start and you can take over. For me, it was a terrifying experience um, <laughs> in the... The Golden Globes, everybody, I mean, we don't drink, but everybody else is drunk. And it feels more like a kind of party type situation. Um, the Oscars, and we went to some other ones that I, I you know, whatever, there was a Critics' Choice, there was an Eternal yeah. LA Critics one, whatever. We'd been, to, we'd been through this thing, all of which was new to us. And by the time we got to the Oscars, we were a bit more familiar with the kind of stakes and whatnot. And you could tell that was radically different to the Golden Globes, the level of stress, and it was just different. And um, under your seat, you actually have an energy bar, just in case the fear is going to make you pass out, you can eat it, which I did. Um, then when we were called, for me, it was more about, I really want to make it up this staircase without falling over. I was wearing some rather smart shoes that had, uh, were a bit slippery. Trent had had the good idea to put some sellotape on the bottom of his, I think. Anyway, I made it up there, and then we have these two giants. I mean, they're both like eight feet tall. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're Australian. They are. You're, you're, yeah. you're very nice, but incredibly <laughs> tall. I and am very tall. There you go. Then it just became a kind of thing of, of uh, 
I, I don't remember the talking bit. And then suddenly you're rushed backstage and Oprah Winfrey's there and then you're in another place. I mean, it, it was it was insane, but it wasn't. For some reason, the stress, even though it, it is an incredible thing to have happened in one's life. Personally, for me, life is all about. Can I be in that moment or not? And I found the Golden Globes, I really was one of the rare occasions when I could really actually enjoy what was happening. And I think in the Oscars, I was just too kind of stressed out to really be able to comprehend it at that moment. You know what I mean? So that was mine. That was my one of those later experiences. But Trent, do say. No, my my experience that day mirrored Atticus's, where you know, it's, you, to put it in context, you know, we were primarily concerned with just not fucking up the movie and seeing if we could just get something they could tolerate as the score because it was our first thing, you know. And they they were integral team were firing on you know thousand percent, and we were just trying to not hurt their film because you know, we felt like we didn't know what we were doing rather we just kind of making it up and then as we finished it we felt very proud of the film you know we'd never gone into that film even thinking about award season or even really knowing what that is it's not something that i ever even thought about and as we started to hear buzz about the movie and suddenly there's an interest in the movie and suddenly there's uh you know wins some critics awards and then there was a, you know, probably twenty events that each one you needed to dress up for, and there's the Palm Springs Film Festival, and there's the Producers Guild, and there's the Directors Guild, and there's the Actors Guild, and there's the Critics Choice Guild, and then there's you know, there's the Society of Lyricists and Composers wants you to come to their house, and it's all weird, right? And it's all intimidating because we kind of feel like, man, we don't belong here. <laughs> you know, we've bullshit our way into this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, seeing the amount of care and and how serious the Academy takes that award um, to finally win it, you know, was was pretty profoundly um, fulfilling. And, and it because it felt like it wasn't uh, when you win a Grammy, it's bullshit. You know, some some dude in the back room for some reason, you know, <laughs> thought of your name and then, yeah, it's not it's not earned. Um, the the Oscar felt like, wow, we're we're being um, appreciated for our work here in a, from a pretty significant place. People that actually do it, you know. And it felt good. That day, though, was at the tail end of all those other events. And like Attica said, you know, the, the it's a surreal, fairly unpleasant day of terrifying experiences <laughs> up against each other from a red carpet that is unlike anything a normal human ever has to experience in their life. To sitting in a tiny, you know, that theater is much smaller than it feels like, and you've been there for 15 hours, no one's eaten, and everyone's got bad breath, and everyone's scared, and you're sitting right next to the people you're competing with, you know, and they're, you know, they hate you, and you hate them. I'm kidding. <laughs> kind of cool. Well, and, uh, you know, then, then to hear your name, it's fantastic, but it's like slow motion car crash. Get up hold this don't trip step out check over these cables watch out for the camera don't wipe out going up the steps they're giants hold this thing move the mic and try to remember what you have planned in case you did win big number counting down 14 13. when you look at the audience every single face you recognize robert de niro johnny depp you know every single person out there and they're looking at you and it's pretty overwhelming <laughs> as Atticus said I wasn't kind of kicking back enjoying it it was like jumping out of a plane for the first time I just don't <laughs> want to die or shit my pants you know till I'm back yeah. Yeah, yeah. you did good like you did real good and um Hold it in. yeah yeah I mean unfortunately we're running out of time but I will mention that um Nine Inch Nails has been inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame which has been postponed until November um, alongside Depeche Mode and the Doobie Brothers and Whitney Houston, Notorious B.I.G. T-Rex. Um, in like 20 seconds, how thrilled are you about that? 
No, I, I think that's pretty cool. You know, I've been a cynic because I think the concept of, you know, a Hall of Fame for rock and roll, let's award the, the art form that's about not conforming. You know, it kind of seems absurd. And then when you look at who's in it, you know, and when you look who's not in it, you know, there's a lot of uh, craft work, for example. It's hard to feel excited about how legitimate something is when someone that's that important hasn't been acknowledged. Yeah. With that said, you know, I was asked to induct a cure last year. I did it because I, w- I love the cure and I wanted the cure. I knew I would do a good speech because I was going to work my ass off. And it felt good. And when I was there, a lot of my uh, cynicism. went away i don't know if i'm still even being recorded right now am i yeah definitely are uh, unfortunately atticus okay. is um dropped off but that's okay I'm right. see if you can... in the end, when i was there in that yeah. room you know the crowd the cure come out and i heard the screams of the crowd and i watched the cure play and i saw robert smith and the band smile off what i said and i see that you know to the people in that room it is a pretty significant thing but i thought i'm sitting at a table with the guys from radiohead we're watching uh roxy music with David Byrne, okay, you know what I mean. I, I can, I can uh, step away from some of my snarkiness and cynicism, and, and this was pretty cool. You know, uh, it, it did feel nice to be acknowledged, and that's what it is. There's a yeah, as a lifetime achievement thing, it feels feels pretty good. So I'm grateful. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I have to move on and uh, let you guys go. But my final question is, obviously, you've collaborated with David Fincher a few times, like on Gone Girl and The Social Network and Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Um, you're working on Mank, or I know you've got Soul coming up, which is, seems like a departure for you guys, and then you have Mank. But what can you, firstly, what can you tell us about that highly anticipated project, both of them? And also, what's special about working with Fincher? Uh, I'll take the slack since Atticus is hopscotting on and off for me. Do you want to talk while you three seconds you put me on? It's coronavirus. Pat, Mank and uh, Soul. What was the question again? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, tell us, tell us what we can expect. And then also, why is Fincher so special to work with? Well, we've actually signed. NDA, so we can't tell you what to expect. <laughs> but I can tell you that they're both, we're very proud of the work, and obviously Finch's is in progress, so um, we're certainly not done with that by any means. But I've seen the film uh, or the first cut, and I thought it was incredible. Um, I can't remember the second bit of the question, so I'll pass on to Trent. Why, why is uh, Fincher great to work with? Uh, yeah. Because we respond to excellence and respect and generosity. And as our introduction to the world of scoring with Social Network, you know, I was very honest with David about, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And he provided a very safe and encouraging workplace where it's like, you do know what you're doing and you're going to be fine and let's go, you know. And throughout the process, you know, it uh, it felt like if we ran as fast as we could, we could we could just keep up, and it was an exhilarating feeling, you know. And we're we're with people that every person working on that film was at the top of their game, you know. And it really felt like these are the people I want to be around. These are the people I feel inspired by. Um, and it taught us taught us both a lesson, you know, of I think as we've worked independently for so long, you know, you can become insular and kind of get complacent in a sense because you're just in your own camp. To be exposed to somebody that is firing at that high a cylinder and really wants what is best for the picture at all costs will fight and scream and yell to make sure you have the space to do what's uncompromisingly the best thing for this thing. We're all in this to make the very best picture we can possibly make. That That is um, an inspiring, exciting energy that uh, I think the world and art needs more of. And we, we love him as a person, and it's always a great time working with him. 
Well, we and I'll just add one forward. quick. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. If Winter actually told told me about Kubrick and the way he would work would be to make sure that he employed the people that he thought, you know, that he respected and thought were good, and then empowered them to to let them be good at what they did. Because the film experiences that we've had have been less fulfilling, a way you feel like you're being micromanaged and you're not being allowed to be, to, in essence, you're not being allowed to do your best work because somebody else thinks they know how to do your job better than you do kind of thing. And that is the opposite, opposite experience. Fincher because certainly he'll have opinions and whatever but he he's he he bring he brings out the best in you because he allows you to be your best if you know what I mean yeah, that's I that's the only thing I want to add it sounds very exciting we're really looking forward to um to seeing the film and hearing your score for Soul and for Mank and um and perhaps your future projects thanks so much guys for your time today we really really do appreciate it thank you thank you um, Be safe. Everybody, thank you, you too. Everybody go to Gold Derby while you're staying at home, make your predictions and click subscribe to watch all of our chats. See you, everybody.